world mankind had dreamt of taking to the air. But in those days, any practical attempt seemed only to confirm the beliefs of the less visionary. Flying was strictly for the birds. But success at last. In 1903, two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, took to the air and their first steps into the unknown. Orville Wright climbed aboard this fragile-looking contraption and flew the first ever solo flight in a powered aircraft. That first flight from takeoff to landing would today fit inside a 747. Wilbur and Orville made three more flights that day, wrecking the machine but changing the world. It took only another 66 years before the first man was to walk in space. And just 78 years after the Wright brothers flew, the first returnable spacecraft touched down at Edwards Air Force Base, the Space Shuttle Columbia. So within a man's lifetime, flight had come of age. At Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, many pioneering flights were achieved. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier on the morning of October the 14th, 1947. Slung under the belly of a B-17 bomber, the X-1, named Glamorous Glennis after the pilot's wife, launched and broke the sound barrier, causing the first sonic boom just days before the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight. Once the sound barrier was passed, the whole universe opened up and pioneering accelerated on a lavish scale. In 1957, the Russians had launched Sputnik, the first communication satellite. The Americans, not to be put out, started the space program. During this time, research into spaceflight and the idea of a returnable spacecraft was called upon, and scientists began looking into a steerable parachute system, or a folding wing, allowing a capsule to be returned safely to Earth by landing at an airbase or on a runway. There were some rather bizarre designs emerging from the drawing board, including this one, a completely wingless shape being towed behind a Pontiac. This, along with many other projects for returnable spacecraft, were abandoned by NASA in favor of the space shuttle, and quite right, too. Go from eight inch and start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff on Columbia and its return to flight. One other design to fail was Dr. Francis Rogallo's idea of a steerable parachute system, which would allow a capsule to glide down to Earth. Rogallo's amazing invention was simple, and although rejected by NASA, his efforts attracted the eyes of a few flight enthusiasts in California. And Californians, being what they are, decided to make gliders based on Rogallo's designs at homes, in garages and workshops. After much development and research by a few brave individuals, the now familiar shape of the hand glider emerged. As soon as I found out about hand gliding, I got involved in it. I was immediately grabbed by it. You can't really explain what it is, but it's just something just grabs you. But, like most people uh, from my background, never ever thought that flying would be um, accessible to me in terms of just purely monetary terms. It's just one of those things that people with money did and everybody else didn't. Yeah, I started, started hang gliding and it was late 77 by now and managed to find a school, funnily enough, run by Graham Slater, who, who you know, uh, weather was against us and managed to find a hang glider and together with a friend of mine, we managed to just about teach ourselves to, to fly it because the weather for the school was just, never seemed to be suitable. Then it went on to putting aircraft, putting engines onto it, onto hang gliders. And from that evolved through various other stages of microlight. The term microlight was first coined by pilot Jerry Breen and soon adopted by the BMAA. I'd known of Jerry by obviously all the publicity he'd had on his earlier ventures. He was interested in the sprint at that stage, the South Down Sprint, which was the first, uh, well, one of the first two-seat microlights to get full Section S. I was asked to go along as an engineer and a reserve pilot on a microlight expedition to Venezuela. And we built, we being myself and uh, 
and others at Southdown Sail Wings built two float equipped Puma Sprints and the idea was to take these to Venezuela and fly about 30 miles uh, from a large lake to the base of Angel Falls and then try and fly to the summit and ideally do a forced landing on the top um, to copy Jimmy Angel's uh, trek out. The idea was we'd fly in and land at the top, hopefully not crash like Jimmy Angel. Now the snag with that was that the Venezuelan authorities uh, thought it, was, it sounded too much like a James Bond movie and they started asking for more and more money to get permission to film in their national park. Wow. So at the last minute, the film company pulled out of the microlight side, said, look, forget the microlight side. What else can we do? We've got the location. Uh, how about two hang gliders? You walk to the top with hang gliders and launch, launch from the summit. And well, it was just down to Jerry and I then, out of the team, and we decided, well, yeah, let's go. The hang glider wing had proved itself to be safe, so all sorts of contraptions, mainly imported from the States, started to appear. You didn't need to have any form of license to fly one, just pluck up the courage and off you go. When Michael and I came on, we had the first trikes. Um, I was lucky that somebody else had, could afford to buy a trike, and uh, been watching them for a while, and this one day he said to, do you have a go? So I said, you try stopping me and uh, took off and flew around for about 20 minutes, which was quite a long flight then. Um, and you treated it basically almost like a powered hang glider in many ways. The early trikes were hang glider wings with a trike attachment bolted to it. And one trike may be bolted to sort of several other types of wing. To control this growing craze, the Civil Aviation Authority stepped in and insisted on safety for the pilot, air traffic and the general public. They require airworthiness standards, noise certification, and aircraft registration, along with instructor ratings, a private pilot's license, and medical certificates. You don't need an examination, but you must be fit to fly. Like a Cessna or other light aircraft, the Microlite is classified as a very real aeroplane, and the CAA have certain guidelines for their manufacture. They insist on weight restrictions, wing loading, and can carry only a maximum fuel load. All new aircraft have to undergo strict safety tests and destruction tests, but it doesn't restrict the fun and excitement you get flying these remarkable aircraft. But even with these legal requirements, are they really safe? It's as safe or as dangerous as you want to make it. Um, the sport is governed now, governed relatively well. The aircraft are very strong. They, they still have the appearance of being flimsy, but pound for pound, they are stronger than most other aircraft flying. Uh, the stress testing is, is for 6G positive and 4G negative, uh, which you'd never ever encounter in your normal flying career, that sort of stress and weight limits. And the, the teaching is now done to an approved syllabus with improved instructors that have to go through rigorous tests and, and constant checking. Even as a qualified flying instructor, you have to be uh, retested every two years. There's not many other professions that have that sort of control over what's going on. This is another microlight. These have set new records in long distance aviation. Eve Jackson was the first female pilot to reach Australia solo, followed closely by Brian Milton. It's a great adventure, it's a, it's a wheeze. I did a lot when I was a lot younger. I drove an Austin 7 across the Sahara Desert and down through the Congo, and I spent about nine weeks on the road in America doing a Jack Kerouac jumping freight train and things like that. This aircraft took Brian Milton on a memorable two-month journey through some of the most inhospitable skies in the world. Powered only by a standard microlight engine, he encountered some interesting landings on the way. And I came into a very rough air, to, but to a very safe landing. And immediately afterwards, the wind caught under my right wing and just flipped me straight upside down. And uh, ever since then, we've been pulling bits and pieces of the Dalgetty flyer to pieces so that uh, we can put it back together again. But he made it. 
Over nine emergency landings and nearly being blown out of the skies by a military helicopter, he went on to fly the longest leg of his journey. Ten and a half hours at the controls of this tiny aircraft, he landed in the outback, in the dark, between three lightning storms and just in time for a major earthquake. David Young and travel writer Christina Dodwell flew a trike through some of the world's most difficult terrain, 7,000 miles across the African continent, with no ground support and only fuel dumps provided by the sponsor. The aircraft they used is still in use as a training machine at David Young's Flight Training Centre in Wiltshire. And bike rides aren't, aren't the little sort of toys that a lot of people would, would perhaps think they are. They've flown on expeditions in Iceland. Um, a Dutchman has flown one across the Atlantic. Uh, I've flown a microlight in Nepal with another of our, the country's top competition pilots, Simon Baker, and we were flying up to 20,000 feet. Um, I've flown 7,000 miles across Africa in a microlight aeroplane. Other people have been to sort of altitudes of 26, 27,000 feet. Richard and Meredith Hardy flew to Africa from England in a microlight, cr crossing the Mediterranean. Um, microlights are being used for anti-poaching patrols in Africa. Uh, they're, they're being used uh, for crop spraying in, in France and advertising, towing banners along and so on. So the, you know, these machines are an amazing aerial platform, which I think expedition organisers are becoming increase increasingly aware of. Um, so they're not just toys, and the fact that they can be used in these extreme environments uh, makes our sort of flying around Gloucestershire look perhaps rather tame by comparison. Most of these people had little previous expertise, normal people with a passion for flight and a spirit of adventure. All you need to join them is locate your nearest microlight flying school or club and book a short trial lesson, which all adds up to your total hours for flying training. The first thing is to say, right, I want to, I'd like to get my feet off the ground. Can I book a trial lesson with one of your instructors? OK, Mel, you'll need one of these headsets in here. This one just up there, if you'd like to help yourself. Okay. And a helmet. That's great. And we'll go out to the aeroplane. Great. The trial flight consists of a safety brief and instructions on how to board the aircraft, where to step and what to look for. Right, OK, we're going to go out to Lima Golf just here and um, want to have a good look at the aeroplane, as we're just going to be taking an overall look at it. We've already checked it over thoroughly. Tire pressures, there isn't a pool of oil under the engine, OK? Yep. Um, now I want to show you just how to get in before, uh, before we get in properly. Right. Uh, main centre of the structure there is here, so I'll put my foot on that hands on the seat frame and then up into the back seat where right. you're going to be for this air experience flight. Yep. OK, um, I'm going to show you how to put this full harness on, all right, and to release it properly on the buckle there. All right, tighten there and release by pressing. Yep. And just a little reminder again, choke lever on the seat frame, hand throttle on the seat frame this side, just to be aware of those things and uh, keep your hands on uh, in board. This side, not a problem, but remember we've got the exhaust round here, so we don't want you leaning on the exhaust pipe in case we go up in a cloud of smoke. OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. Now, if you give me your helmet, right. and if you'd like to put the headset on. OK. That looks pretty good. All right. And this goes right over the top, like so. Chin up, and we'll just do this up for you. There we go. And Mike about there. Fine. Yep. Now we can get into the machine, just as I showed you. Mount it. Tighten it up. Grand. This plugs in down here. The headset and intercom system allows you to talk to your instructor okay. at all times during your flight, right. so you're not alone in the back there. OK, there's your glass. That's a little bit cosy. All you need initially is your own enthusiasm that you want to take up the sport and a little bit of money to get you up in the air. Get your feet off the ground with an instructor, see whether you enjoy it. If it's living up to your expectations, I'm sure you will find it very exciting. The first trial lesson is 20 minutes in the air. And, um, and go from there, see if you like it. This, you know, we have a lot of people talking about it and not actually getting their feet off the ground. Well, let's see, let's, let's see if you like it. 
you'll notice as you take off that the total distance for the takeoff roll is very short compared to a conventional light aircraft like a Cessna, and the takeoff speed is low. You get an opportunity to put your hands on the controls of the aircraft and feel the uh, fly how to fly the aeroplane a little bit yourself, just a, a little taster there, and you'll see how the aeroplane performs, what the view's like, what the world looks like from a couple of thousand feet or whatever. Your instructor will demonstrate the aircraft and show you how easy it is to fly. No effort required, the aeroplane flies itself. A lot of people ask what happens if the engine stops. Well, there's nothing to fear. The aeroplanes glide extremely well. It's not a major problem. And we're particularly keen in microlight aircraft training to make sure that you know how to deal with an engine failure. In normal training, when we come into land, we don't turn the engine off, but we do glide. So from about 500 feet, the engine will just be ticking over and we'll be gliding all the way in till touchdown. So that's an important part of your training. So engine failures are all part of pilot training and sometimes they do happen, but it's no big deal. The aircraft is a very good glider, much better than a light aircraft. They have a glide ratio of about 8 to 1, so all you've got to do is find the biggest possible open space to land it in. So all in all, a safe little aircraft. They will not cause you any problems unless you take them way outside the, uh, the flight envelope of the aircraft, which is defined. We can't actually do aerobatics in micro light aircraft. We're not allowed to exceed 60 degrees of bank, for example. And there are certain limits on the pitch angle, uh, and those up or down. Um, so they're not an aerobatic machine. So it's safe, but what about the costs? It isn't a cheap sport anymore. Um, it's not a particularly expensive sport, but it isn't something um, you can do without planning your budget properly. I think that um, micro lighting has, has sold itself short over the latter few years, and people are still clinging on to the past. It's moved on from then. We can still learn from the past, obviously, um, but things have become more expensive. Aircraft, a trike unit used to cost 500 to 750 pounds back then, and now you're looking at up to 15,000 pounds for a flex wing now. A new flex wing aircraft will cost you these days um, about the same as a small car. Uh, if you're the sort of person that can afford to go out and buy yourself a nice new sports car next month, then you'll probably be the sort of person that'll want to buy a nice new aircraft. If you want to particularly, when you've been flying with us for a while, you particularly like a certain aircraft, um, that we might be able to find you one second hand which suits your pocket, or we might be able to fit you into a syndicate where you can share one. So and initially, you need nothing yourself. The school will provide you with helmets, good quality intercom system, gloves, flying suit. Um, there are even second hand books in our lecture room and so on. Initially, you need outlay nothing other than for your training lessons. There are a lot of different ways of actually approaching flying in my flight aircraft. The first approach, which I really recommend, is to do go on from your trial flight if you'd, you'd enjoyed it and do a short course. An intensive course of training over about four days will provide you with seven or eight flying hours under your belt, get you a long way towards solo, get you into really understanding the sport, how to put the aeroplanes together and take them down and check them over and so on, and um, without the terrific capital expenditure of buying an aeroplane or buying into a syndicate or, you know, getting more good, good committed. It has the other very big advantage that training in, a, in an intensive period like that, you will make much more progress than if you start doing the one lesson a week. Because if you book for one lesson a week, then, uh, um, sure as heck, the weather's going to cancel your lesson one week, possibly two weeks in a row, and before you know it, you haven't flown for a month and, and so on. So it does need some commitment on your part if you want to make progress. Well, it looks like this student could do with a bit more commitment. Enough said. One of the most appealing things about trike flying is the fact that the whole kit can be transported by its owner to a farmer's field, microlight club or aerodrome, and in about half an hour or so you can be airborne. And if you don't want to trailer your aircraft around, most schools and clubs provide hangarage, either semi-rigged or fully de-rigged, so the choice is yours. 
They're simple and transportable. You can keep them at home. We will go in a, in a, in a garage. A trike also, of course. Poor old car has to sit outside. Um, but you can keep it at home and then take it off to a flying field wherever it's reasonably near you, or to different flying sites. Take it on holiday with you, take it abroad on a little trailer. Uh, low maintenance, very little to go wrong. No sort of rods and cables going out to control surfaces. The aircraft are easy to handle and assemble. It may look a little difficult at first, but as part of your training, you will be given full instruction on how to rig and de-rig, how to transport the machine and what fuel to use and so on. The training's very thorough and set to a recognised syllabus. Flex wings do need a little careful looking after when on the ground, more than the three-axis machines. Depending on the site that you operate from, um, I think it's fair to say that some three-axis machines can cope with more adverse weather than the flex wing machine. The main problem with the flex wing machine uh, in terms of weather is actually handling it on the ground. If it gets too windy, uh, just uh, quite a big sail there, getting it off the trike and, uh, and putting it all away uh, can be a bit of a handful. Aircraft can be flown from anywhere in the country, providing you have the landowner's permission and subject to certain airspace considerations. If you own a field very close to Heathrow, then it's extremely unlikely you'll get permission to fly your microlite from it. We have a fantastic advantage with microlite aeroplanes that they can land and take off in relatively small spaces, and so therefore, our sites that we can fly from are just endless. Farm fields, anywhere, if you can get permission of the landowner. For your training, we have an exemption uh, in microlite flying uh, in that you can train or we can train you from anywhere also. We don't have to be a, a conventional, fully licensed aerodrome. You can fly the aeroplanes uh, anytime between half an hour before sunrise until half an hour after sunset. So what about cross-country flying? In terms of range, um, you can, with a standard XL, for example, you'd only have really about an hour and 50 minutes safe range. But with the latest cross-country tank, large tank, uh, you're looking at sort of three and a half hours range on the air-cooled and a lot more on the, on the liquid-cooled engine, which is a very efficient machine. Uh, very low fuel consumption, so there's quite popular on a sort of environmental level in, the, in terms of work that they, they will not use anything like the same amount of fuel as a, as a light aircraft or a helicopter. If you're flying dual, the engine will have to work a bit harder, you use a bit more fuel. If you're flying solo, you'll have a greater range. The flex wing will cruise between 45 and about 65 miles an hour as a, as a rough guide. And a lot will economically cruise at about 50 to 55 miles an hour. So those are the sort of airspeeds you're talking about. Obviously, if you're flying into the wind, you'll make less progress over the ground. There is an organisation in this country which is responsible for all microlite flying and the production of microlite aircraft, in a way, it oversees that, and that's the BMAA, the British Microlite Aircraft Association. And its offices are at Deddington um, in Oxfordshire, and you can join the BMAA for a very small fee, get a magazine that comes out every couple of months, and all sorts of notes that will help you about your flying, technical information, safety bulletins, and so on. And the BMAA, in conjunction with the Civil Aviation Authority, produced a syllabus of training, which is largely modelled on the original Group A private light aircraft training syllabus. Having a copy of the syllabus, which is only, only a couple of pounds, is very important to you, because it also provides a check for you when you're going through your training to see that your instructor has taken you through every single little point of the syllabus that he should have done. So it's a two-way thing, a guide for the instructor and a guide for you as the student to see that you've covered everything. When you've completed the syllabus of practical flying training, the ultimate aim there will be doing a GFT, which is a general flying test, which is a test of your practical skills and ability. And of course, there will come a time in every student pilot's life when you'll have to go it alone on that very first solo. The solo is obviously a major milestone in, your, in taking up flying, and it's something that people look for. And of course, once you go solo, it's, it's quite often cheaper to fly more solo, so it becomes something, can become something of a feature. Uh, I have sent somebody solo in a flex-wing aircraft in as little as five and a half hours, but they really have to have a little, sort of certain natural aptitude. Overall, we find that solo time is usually about 12 to 14 hours to solo. Um, and after that, um, 
you know, you can, you're away, you'll find things that quickly progress towards completing your license. Now, the two types of license are an unrestricted license and a restricted license. The unrestricted license was really introduced to allow people to reach a certain stage and then escape having to be supervised by an instructor. So they could go off and fly from their own site with certain restrictions on them, but they could build up their flying experience uh, near to home where they had good access to the aircraft. And uh, then they could go back to an instructor to finish off the navigation side of the uh, license training requirements and then get their full license. So along with your practical flying training, you'll also need to study. There are a few exams you'll need to pass before you can get your full license. The exams are multiple choice uh, question paper. Uh, so you haven't got to actually write any essays about everything. You've got to just demonstrate that you understand all the knowledge that you should understand in order to fly safely. Now the subjects are uh, aeroplanes technical, that's sort of how and why the aeroplane flies, um, air law, so that's sort of where we can fly and when, if you like. Navigation and meteorology are coupled in one examination together. And then uh, there's an HPL exam now, that's Human Performance Limitations, which is looking at the sort of things that, about ourselves and how our own minds work to make sure that we don't make human error mistakes when we're, when we're, when we're flying. And then there's an oral exam, which is particularly about the type of aircraft that you've been training on. Now, none of it's really too difficult. I think the great thing about flying is that all the subjects that we have to look at, um, once you get into flying and into the practical flying, you will find interesting. When you've got through the challenging process of learning how to fly your aeroplane, and um, you're moving on now, you've got your own machine and you're getting about the countryside, um, you must understand that from the beginning, your aircraft also has to have a logbook by law, and you must enter that up with any details of any maintenance that's gone on with that aeroplane. So if you have any particular maintenance work that's done by your machine, we must get an inspector to look at it. Because they're operated under what's called a permit to fly, which is like a sort of MOT, which has to be done every year, um, you can do a lot of that maintenance yourself as, a, as an owner. I think one of the great things about flying is it's something that you will go on enjoying throughout the rest of your life if you take it up. So it's going to be an interest now when you're training and a challenge for all sorts of reasons. You'll see the world from a different perspective. You'll fly among the clouds. You, you literally, you'll have your mind blown by it all. But you will never stop learning about flying. I've been flying 11 years now, and the process goes on. And I've done quite a lot of hours. But I'm always learning. I go up, and the air is different. The light is different. The clouds look different. Uh, the whole experience and excitement of flying is always there and will go on growing and developing right through your life. So I think that's one of the great challenges, that um, it's not all just there in an instant. Um, it's, something, it's something for life that you will enjoy. You never stop learning. The day that you think you've stopped learning is a, is a day you really ought to stop flying. And it teaches you a lot amongst, uh, about yourself. It's not just about learning to fly an aircraft, because you, you come to terms with fears that you might have or inadequacies, inadequacies that you might believe that you have and it, it is a it's a learning experience over quite a period of time but it concentrates the mind and other things you can't really go flying if you've had a bad day to try and blow your troubles away it doesn't always work that way and it's not something that you can just take off and do it, it, it takes a certain amount of mental preparation and there's people now that i talk to fly back in the early 80s um, that I still keep in touch with now and they don't, they cease to become students and they become personal friends. Um, in fact, several of the, my students now that I'm actually training now have just got their license now and now, you know, close personal friends. That is that's one of the beauties of it because you always have a common bond. You have a common bond of flying, but you get such a varied type of person. You get people from, from farmers to solicitors to even bank clerks, artists. There's such a wide variety of people that you can't help to be uh, mesmerised by the whole sort of uh, cosmopolitan type of person that you get here. I was up in the Arctic and we were using a powered parachute for scientific research. I'm a geologist by training and I spend most summers in polar regions carrying out geological fieldwork. So I saw the benefits of the powered parachute and thought, right, 
try and learn to fly a microlite because obviously a microlite is much more versatile than the powered parachute. Hence, I got some free time earlier this year and some spare cash and I decided to go for a microlite license with the ultimate aim of using it for scientific research. The one thing that I've learned a lot about were engines. I haven't a clue about engines. I th the engine in my car was just something that went to the garage every so often to get serviced. But certainly the mechanical side has been brilliant. Great experience, yeah. Obviously there aren't enough women. Women uh, generally make very good flyers. They, most of them lack the physical strength of um, the male counterparts, but they generally make up for that by being more technical. When I first started, I used to find my arms got really sore and I had to work really hard going swimming and things to get the old biceps improved because particularly when you come on to doing landings, you know, if you're doing maybe 20 landings, you've got to be fit enough to be able to do that. So whereas they can't heave the aircraft around the sky, they'll actually fly more technically to get the same effect. And um, yes, I've taught some very good female pilots. Another aspect of microlight flying are the competitions. Richard Meredith Hardy is a seasoned veteran of competitions and has been flying since 1984. I think you get to know your machine very well when you're doing competitions. I mean, there are lots of the uh, limited fuel ones. Um, you know, the idea is you go out for five hours or something on the fuel that you've got and, and to, be out, to run out of fuel on the approach. And when you, um, when you can do that, then, uh, then that's pretty good judgment. I, I have never actually managed to actually run out on the approach, so I've run out a couple of times taxiing back or something. <laughs> People are using microlites for all sorts of reasons. Well, if you can land a Harrier on an aircraft carrier, why not try a microlite? A little bit of aviation history in the making. So there we are, the microlite aeroplane, affordable, safe, transportable and fun. Cheap to maintain and with enormous potential for serious work in the third world. But there are rules and regulations, as with any form of aviation. But is the sport too regulated for its own good? In France, the restrictions aren't so tight. The sort of state of mind, if you like, in this country is that you should be protected from yourself. What happens in France is that uh, you've got this situation where um, Machines tend to be tremendously a lot cheaper, 20% cheaper at least, than your average English machine. But this country development has ceased in all practical sense because nobody can afford to do the development. Um, I mean, when it costs £2,000 in fees just to get a propeller through, you know, you think how much it costs to get a whole machine through, and it's, 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 it, there's nobody doing any development anymore, which is a shame, surely. I should warn you that. Uh, in Britain, we do suffer rather, from rather overbearing restriction by the CAA, and we're not allowed to use microlites in this country for commercial work at the moment. We hope, with all the changes that are going on in Europe, that eventually uh, that will change, and we might have a basic commercial pilot's licence available for a microlite pilot uh, who wants to do something serious with that aeroplane. The exception, of course, is in instruction, the lifeline of the sport. The instructors and the clubs are really the, the grassroots, the core of it. And without having um, that basis, um, the sport will die. So you need to have an instructor. And the instructor needs to make a living, not necessarily a good living, because you do it not for the money. You do it because you actually enjoy the lifestyle. Not that the lifestyle is particularly affluent, but it. You enjoy being flying and being part of flying. It gets into your blood, you can't get out of it. Summing up microlighting, uh, it's being able to enjoy the freedom of a two-seat aeroplane that has a good safety record, and you can use it like a flying quality motorcycle. One thing that speaks for itself now is we have a lot of inquiries now from light aircraft pilots. There are a lot of people who've flown light aircraft or gliders or whatever who are interested in flying microlights. And they realise that the sport's come of age, that the aircraft is safe, they've been in, air, in flying environments and they have a, a certain much more respect now for microlight pilots and what we're trying to do uh, in in, within our organisations in terms of training, the training standards. To me, it's, it's different from conventional light, air, light aviation. I don't want to see uh, all our 
microlite schools and clubs become just like small versions of conventional flying clubs. I think we've got more to offer than that. I'd like to believe in some of the basic philosophies of the British Microlite Aircraft Association, which formed 10, 11 years ago, whatever, um, really as affordable flying for everybody. And I, I'd like to think that we are still trying to present that. Uh, there's still a pioneering spirit there, and it's open cockpit flying at, at reasonably low air speeds. And to be able to cruise from one end of the country to the other on a, on a good day with a friend in the back, land out, take camping equipment maybe, is, is fabulous. And it's only being made available by all the work put in by pioneers working from year dot. It's only now that we've had the technology with high quality sail materials, high quality alloys, high quality steels really to build this lightweight structure that is very strong. And thanks to Rotax with their high quality, high power lightweight engines, we've got a really good bit of kit that hopefully will give a lot of people um, plenty of hours of safe flying and enjoyable flying, not, uh, not just being locked in a tin box looking at instruments. It's actually seat of the pants, open air flying.